part of the training committee. And today we have a uh, very important guest. Alma Nasser is the head deputy of the appellate branch of the Los Angeles County Public Defender's Office, where he has worked for 44 years. He's the co-author of three Thomson Reuters publications, including the California Evidence Code, Annotated, and California Trial Objections. He has argued nine cases to the California Supreme Court and one to the United States Supreme Court. I'm very grateful for him to be here, and um, Marlene and Rachel Ewing call him a god and the greatest of all time. <laughs> <laughs> so you know he's good. Here's out. But no pressure. This is why I write out introductions and try to insist that they be read, and you can believe that I did not write that. Um, so I, I don't know if you guys all followed that. Um, our wonderful, fabulous President Donald Trump uh, spent a couple of hours with uh, Putin in uh, Finland. Uh, and some people thought it was like uh, some kind of summit meeting, but in fact, it was just a performance review. <laughs> uh, so uh, I do this talk, I do it for the criminal lawyers. Uh, it's a courtroom evidence talk. I have never heard anyone give this talk before. Uh, and it is not a talk about the rules of evidence. I recognize that in dependency court, the rules of evidence are much different. I'm not sure there are any, but, but they are much different. This is not, here's criminal evidence, and therefore it's irrelevant to you. This is a talk on what happens in the courtroom, the kinds of objections and issues, the form of the question, uh, and I'm, what I'm going to do is run through a whole series of objections to questions, a whole series of objections to answers, and some foundational issues. Um, and I have a couple of global points I want to make at the outset. Uh, the thing, there's two things I want to communicate, and they're actually somewhat inconsistent. The first is, I read transcripts, I watch lawyers, and in my experience, most lawyers have three objections. Not the same three. Three, three different ones, but only three. And in a trial, I'll see only three objections made the entire trial. Part of the goal here is to have consciousness raising about a lots of different objections and a lots of different ways to challenge things. So that's part of the goal is a consciousness raising. The other part of the goal is this. If you take away one thing from this talk, here's the thing I want you to take away. Don't just react. What I see the lawyers doing wrong, I see my lawyers, I see transcripts, is that the uh, piece of evidence gets offered, there's an objection, it's sustained, and the lawyer's like, yes, I got the objection sustained. But what were you getting excluded? So let me tell you a story. Back in the day, I was friends with one of the new lawyers in the office, and she was having a very hard time. She was overwhelmed, she couldn't manage her cases. So I said, why don't you come bring a couple of cases to me, and well, let's brainstorm. So she brought in a case I wish I had today. It was the most complicated search and seizure case. I could be a great law school exam. Had like eight major search and seizure issues. It was going to require weeks to get up to speed on this. And I said, well, I have, I have kind of a dumb question I'd like to ask you. What is it you're trying to suppress with this motion? And she told me what she was trying to suppress. And I said, well, is this piece of evidence good for you or bad for you? And she said, I cannot win this case unless that piece of evidence comes into evidence. No. I said, well, why are you trying to suppress it? And she said, because I can. <laughs> Wrong. Wrong. So the value of objection, compound, sustained, yes, is the wrong instinct. The value of getting that objection sustained is nominal. And you have to be asking yourself what you're doing. What I want you to do, what I want you to take away from this, is that in every proceeding, you should have a strategy. What are you trying to do? So let me give you an example. It's a criminal case, and it's you know, I, I'm just in Alhambra having a lunch at the diner on Main. I have trouble with the name because it's a diner on Main. Okay. Uh, and I decided that my strategy in the case was to persuade the jury that the judge liked me. The judge favored me over the DA. That was my strategy. I had done motions, I had all the evidentiary issues all set. That was my strategy. Okay, you can, there's a reason I'm not in trials anymore. I'm just saying. <laughs> that was my strategy. So during this trial, two day drunk driving trial, I made a total of 12 objections total. I only objected on slam dunk winners I couldn't possibly lose. Now, I lost three anyway. I was nine and three on the objections, okay? Which just goes to show you. My point though is, I accomplished the goal. And there's lots of different goals. 
there are opposition lawyers who get distracted, and if you object, they lose track of where they are, and they don't fill in the thing they need. That's a good strategy. It might call for repeated objections, in which case you're going to need a lot of these different objections up your sleeve in order to keep throwing stuff out. My point is that you must have a strategy. You must walk into every hearing and you must think, what am I trying to do in terms of evidence? Am I trying to keep stuff out? Am I trying to get stuff in? Am I trying to distract them? Am I trying to make the jury think that they, the judge likes me? It doesn't matter what the strategy is. What's crucial is that you have a strategy, that you walk in with the strategy. Okay? That's the, the, so the, you can see the two goals are somewhat inconsistent. One is to give you consciousness raising of lots of different objections. But on the other hand, I don't want you necessarily objecting to everything just to show off what a brilliant person you are in the courtroom because you're a great at experts, okay, uh, great at evidence and objections, okay? Um, so I have to tell you one or two little background things. Uh, some of you are old enough to remember, as I do, the first computer legal research tool we had, which was a thing called Law Desk, and it was CDs that you popped in and you could do a search. You had to switch CDs and stuff because I couldn't get all of it, all of California law in one CD. But it was the first time we could really do searches. And some of these objections we're going to talk about today, I would, you know, like, we know these, but what's the authority? And I could never find any authority uh, just doing legal research. Well, once I could search all of California law for a word, I could look at all. So as a result of that, some of the cases that are cited in my handout are oddball weirdo name cases, because I could find any case, right? Uh, so that's kind of where I, where I began in terms of getting this. Let me give you another overall philosophy view of this. <coughs> so if you, I, I hate to do a, a sports thing, so let me, but I, in case you're having any doubt about my nerdness, we're talking about chess, okay? So if you spend all of your time playing chess, trying to remember how the pieces move, you're not doing strategy, okay? You need to have that memorized so that you can then do tactical stuff. Right? And the same is true of any sport. If you're trying to remember how, what the rules are, you're not playing at the, at the level you need to be playing at. So what, you need to, what I want you to do is to internalize the stuff I'm going to go over today so that you already know that. You understand, and that's what we're going to do. Go, I'm going to go through a whole bunch of objections, leading, compound, argumentative, all kinds of objections, very briefly. But the, you know, consciousness raising, and you have a handout where I have them with a case or a statute or whatever. Okay. That's what I want you to do so that at the end, you internalize these so what you're doing in the courtroom is tactical. Do I want to object to this? Do I want this to come in? What am I trying to do to implement your strategy? To do that, you have to internalize the rules so that you're not trying to remember the rules. Now, when I was in trials, I had a little cheat sheet, and it was a list of the objections. And the last page of your handout is that cheat sheet, basically. It's just a list of objections. And I had, this is, you know, so pre-computer. I had a notebook. Here's what I'm speaking from today. And the notebook had the list keyed to something so I could flip to a page and then cite it, you know, very retro. Okay? Uh, but that's what I did in terms of being ready and prepared to be able to litigate these things. Okay. Um, All right. In the handout, I refer to CEB, which is a California Continuing Education of the Bar book called California Trial Objections. Uh, and they, uh, it's an old book, a really old book, uh, it's a 1984 edition. And I used that book as the beginning of this handout and this talk. And then over the years, they kept updating it, and every update was worse. And I didn't understand why they didn't hire me to do the update. Right? I mean, that's what, and then in the end, West hired me, Thomas Reuters hired me to do an update, and I'm co-author of Calvary Trial Objections now, but the other one, the competitor, which of course is much better. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to start by talking about objections to questions. Okay, so I'm going to divide this into a question is asked, what's the objection, versus an answer where you might have an objection. Okay, that's why I'm dividing the talk up so you can follow it. Okay, and you're going to get a series of mini lectures, some of them really short, about each of these kinds of objections. Again, the goal is consciousness raising. So that you've got a wide, wide variety of tools. I'm going to screw this up, but arrows in your quiver. I can never get that right. Or is it quivers in your arrow? I okay, here's the first one, irrelevant. This is one most people have in their quiver. Uh, irrelevant. 
So the definition, you're going to laugh at this, it's not relevant if it's not a dispute. Who knew? Uh, it has to tend to prove some issue in order for it to be relevant. Okay? Now, I, everybody knows that. We immediately get into collateral. And one of the things that happens is you're presenting evidence and they're objecting that it's collateral or you're saying it's collateral. Nobody understands what collateral means. So I gave you the cases. Collateral means, get ready, not relevant. <laughs> if it's not relevant, it's collateral. If it's relevant, it's not collateral. People don't understand. They think that if you're cross-examining based on something other than the direct, if you're saying, isn't it true that you were drinking heavily on the day in question, therefore can't remember what happened, that that's collateral. That's not collateral. Why? Because it's relevant. All right? That makes sense? Okay. That's collateral. Stipulations. One of the things we do in criminal is try to stipulate away facts, try to minimize bad facts. If you can come up with a stipulation that you get the other si everybody else to sign on to, you can sometimes eliminate a thing that might come out very badly for you. Uh, in theory, once there's a stipulation, the evidence is then irrelevant because it's been agreed to and therefore it's not in dispute. That's why it's relevant to that. Okay, this is not just going to be me talking at you with brilliant bond mobs and very hysterical stories. I'm also going to ask you guys nice questions. So, I want to know how many of you have ever heard this, and that is, open the gates or open the door. You asked a question, something came in, the other side then tries to get into it, and you're like, hey, 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 that's irrelevant, and they say, whoa, you open the door, you open the gates. Let me see hands. How many of you ever heard of this? Okay? I have news for you. There's going to be a lot of urban myth coverage today. It is, there's a legal term for this, bullshit. <laughs> there is no such doctrine. And the case law is clear on it. The fact that a piece of evidence came in that was irrelevant, even if you put it in, doesn't open the door, open the gates, not even Bill Gates, to make what the other, some other party wants to get into evidence relevant. It still has to be a point in dispute. Otherwise, it's not admissible. Okay? It's just an urban myth. There's a bunch of these we're going to cover today. Okay? Next, circumstantial evidence of conduct. Now, in the handout, I cover 1101B, which it has a lot of criminal stuff, criminal gloss to it. But 1101B applies to every proceeding. It applies in every case. And 1101B says prior conduct of a witness is not relevant and not admissible to show propensity of the witness. It is, however, relevant if it establishes, and there's a whole list of things it can establish, intent, uh, identity, uh, MO, modus operandi, plan, common scheme. If you're trying to offer a prior thing, your challenge is to identify the category that fits into to make it admissible. And the stuff that is in my handout, the criminal trial, is irrelevant because it doesn't apply to dependency. The just general rules applies to civil trials and everything else. Uh, is covered by 1101B. Uh, it is an underused tool, in my opinion, uh, but it's also something when the other side is trying to offer it, you need to be sensitive to, you know, wait a minute, how is this coming in? Is this propensity evidence? Because 1101B bars propensity evidence. Now, I'm going to skip. There's a couple things in here that are criminal. 1102 is criminal. 1103 is criminal. But I want to talk about 1105. I am seeing people very substantially underutilize 1105. 1105 is habit or custom evidence. And you don't need to establish habit or custom evidence by presenting 50 examples. The case law is amazing how few examples, few instances are sufficient to trigger habit or custom evidence, the admissibility of habit or custom evidence. And if you're trying to attack a witness, trying to dirty up the witness, being able to generate prior instances, now maybe you can't get in for propensity under 1101B, but maybe you can get it in for habit or custom. And we're greatly, the criminal people certainly, are greatly underutilizing the statute. It seems like nobody I've talked to has ever heard of it. So I've given you the statute in a couple of cases to get you to think about. Okay, next, leading questions. Okay, a leading question, you're going to laugh. A leading question is a question that suggests the answer. Right? So if it suggests the answer, it's leading. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. Okay? So I'm going to pick on my lock work because she has no choice. And I'm going to say, you're stupid, dumb, and your mother dresses you funny. Right? Okay? Leading question. Everybody with me? Okay. <laughs> now, let's try it again. You're stupid, ugly, and your mother dresses you funny. Is that right or not? Not leading! 
because I gave her a choice. You can fix any leading question with an or not. You just heard me do it. You just heard me do it. That's not a leading question. Okay? A leading question is telling the witness what you want to answer. Now, in cross, you are leading. All right? That's a whole other issue. And there's law on this. Um, I, there are exceptions. Unfortunately, the exceptions apply almost every time you don't want leading questions. There's an exception for it. Child witnesses, experts. There's a whole slew of exceptions which really piss me off. However, these are not well understood or known by the, by the bench. So you might get a question, uh, objection sustained. Now, I do want to just talk for a moment, because this is all about me, about my favorite television show of all time, Rumpole the Bailey. Some of you people my age maybe even remember this. Uh, barrister, Leo McKern embodied this. Uh, barrister in England, who never pled guilty. And uh, what, what I love is that when the prosecutor would leave, Rumpole would get to his feet and say, perhaps if the prosecutor would like to testify, your honor would like to swear him as a witness. Okay, which I always love as a way to make the objection. But it's actually a fairly straightforward question, uh, objection. Now, let me just say this about leading. Unless you've got a moron against you, they should be able to figure out how to fix a leading question. Now, that's, that doesn't mean you shouldn't object, because again, it may throw them off. There's a strategic consideration here. And the other thing is, if they're overbearing leading, I might let them do it so that I can argue, you didn't really hear from the witness, you heard from that lawyer. I mean, again, this is a strategic thing. You have to know your judge and have a feel for when to do this or not. I'm not a big advocate of leading question objections because they can fix them so easily. Now, maybe you've got a moron and they can't fix it, but probably they're going to be able to. And so what have you really accomplished? Unless you're throwing them off. I mean, they're all the tactical stuff we talked about before. Okay, the next topic is incompetent. I'm going to cover that with respect to answers. Some of the things fit in both categories. Next, speculation. So if the witness is being asked to speculate or guess about an answer, then there's an objection speculation. Again, you might like that. That might be good for you to make them uh, speculate. You, the speculation might be so ridiculous or stupid because you have to have a sense of what you're going to get when you do that. All right, so that's speculation. Next, conclusion. Asking the witness for a conclusion. All right, and there are certain conclusions that are admissible and not. Pretty much any conclusion you don't want is going to come in. Let me just say that. We don't do well on conclusions. Okay, compound. So I had a prosecutor in Compton back in the day when I was in trials who would ask these questions that went on for a minute and minute, and basically he would ask five or six questions at once. So, were you walking down the street uh, on 3rd and Main? Were you, was it raining? And was the lights really good when you, and did you see the guy come at you with a knife? Okay, so we'd ask like four or five questions. All right. Uh, so, this is a strategic, if it's your witness, and your witness is pretty cool, you might just let the person, because they can pick whatever question they want to answer, right? Uh, it was sunny. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? I mean, that worked. On the other hand, if the witness is like on the ropes, and is confused, then you might interpose an objection saying it's a compound question. Now, again, unless they're a moron, you break the question down into four parts, right? I mean, there's not like it can't be fixed. Uh, so you have to make a judgment call. Is your witness going to be able to answer the question effectively enough that you want to let it go? All right. On the other hand, is your opponent so incompetent they can't ask questions that aren't compound questions? Okay, that's your strategic call. But a compound question is just a question that asks more than one. I almost never see people objecting compound questions as a ground. People, I don't think, realize it. Okay, next, ambiguous, vague, too general. This is a really kind of a, a, a vague objection, kind of general and ambiguous. Uh, and basically, questions which are so unclear, the actual question being asked is unknown. Again, you might like that. Let the witness say whatever they want, right? As opposed to, you know, if you, if you get them to clarify it, and, and if they're asking something that's really crucial, and the witness answers in a, kind of not answering the question, but you know, because it was so vague nobody could tell, and the, wit and the examiner goes on to the next topic, they might never fill in that piece that they need to fill. So that might be a strategic reason not to object. But keep in mind that they can't ask questions that where you can't tell what they're asking. Okay, opinion evidence. In theory, you're not supposed to get opinion evidence in. Now, in fact, a ton of opinion evidence is coming in in every case, in my experience, in every court that I see. 
criminal civil. It's amazing how much opinion evidence comes in. Uh, let me just say this. I used to try drunk driving cases in Alhambra, and they'd put the officer on, and at the end of the direct, they'd say, and in your opinion, was the defendant driving under the influence of alcohol at the time? And I'd say, uh, opinion overruled. What? what? How much more of an opinion can it be than he's guilty? Your Honor, what? Okay, so I never won the objection. Again, there's a reason I'm not in trials. But I'm just saying that, in theory, they shouldn't be permitted to ask for an opinion. Now, there is an exception, of course, for lay witnesses, non-expert witnesses. Obviously, an expert can give an opinion, right? But a non-expert, in theory, is barred from giving an opinion, but there's a whole list of exceptions. And there are things like an opinion the person was drunk or whatever. I have a whole list in the handout. Uh, be, so if you're defending and you need to crank one of those out, that's good. If you're objecting, you don't want to help them with what the exceptions are. Uh, now, and I have a list, I may just run through the list real quickly, uh, of cases that have held that lay witnesses can give opinions on the following topics. Identification of previously familiar handwriting, identification of previously familiar voice. I once did a trial, a juvenile trial with, a, with no jury, where the only witness was an identification of my client's voice. And believe me, I lost that trial because there's a reason I'm in a pedal. Okay. Uh, the person was drunk, the person was angry, trying to break up a fight, strong enough impact to jar a passenger from seat. These have all been held to be admissible opinion evidence, right? So you're not necessarily able to knock it out. Now, I'd like to take a poll on you on this. I hear this all the time, that you can't present <coughs> the ultimate opinion in the case. I just gave you an example of he was driving under the influence uh, at the time of the crush, which is what the guy's charged with, okay? Ultimate fact. People say you cannot present a witness to testify to the ultimate fact at issue in the case. Let me see hands. You guys ever heard this before? Nobody's ever heard this before? Nobody? Really? Okay. So it turns out that there's a code section. And the code section says, 805 of the evidence code, says perfectly fine to put in ultimate issues. Even though a lot of people have heard the rule that you can't. Okay? Uh, now, I think you can't ask the ultimate issue in the case. You can't say to the police officer, is he guilty? I mean, I don't, think, I don't think you should be able to ask the ultimate question that's an issue in the case. But I can't give you a case that says that. I can only give you 805, which says, in effect, they can. Seems like there's a usurpation of the role of the judge or jury. Seems to me, but that's where we're at. Okay, let's talk about experts. You guys ever see experts? Really? I'm surprised. Okay. <laughs> All right. So there's a, there's a couple of issues related to experts. So the first, and this is really a big one that we don't spot, is that the person has to be an expert on the issue that they're actually testifying about, which I know may seem stupid, but one of my friends was cross-examining a chemist who was testifying that a drug was cocaine at a prelim, and the chemist was employed by the sheriff's department and blah, blah, blah. And my friend asked him, do you have a college degree? Yeah. What's your degree in? Oceanography. <laughs> He's a judge. How is this guy an expert on cocaine? Okay, of course it came in. I'm just saying. <laughs> in theory, the expertise, and there's some good cases on, okay, you're an expert in schizophrenia, but not paranoia or something. I mean, there's, there are cases where they're drawing lines. You want to look into what is the area of the experts and expert in. Now, in theory, this is tactical, you could ask to take the witness on voir dire and challenge their expertise by running through their credentials to see if they're really qualified on your specific point. Uh, this is a double-edged sword. I generally don't like to do it unless I think I'm going to win because I'd rather just do it in cross. But be aware that you can demand that an expert, what should happen is, I, I don't know if I ever see this except on TV, but what should happen is the proponent of the expert should say, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, what are your credentials? And you've gone to school, and you've done this for 10 years, and you've handled 1,000 patients, and you have an opinion, and blah, 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 blah. Your Honor, I offer the witness as an expert, I, which I never see, but you see it on TV. But I you, know, you could do that. And then in theory, you could, the other side could take the person on cross and say, you know, what were your grades? Uh, do you have any idea what you're talking about? Why is your experts on this and not, expertise is on this and not that, right? So. In theory, you could do it at that point. And in theory, once the person establishes an expert, you should be, it would be harder for you to challenge them as an expert. Uh, but I don't see that. Are you guys seeing that, where people are offering people as experts in the middle of the case? Yeah, I never see it anymore, uh, except on TV. So um, I guess the scriptwriters are my age. 
So the point is that you want to look at what the area of expertise of the expert is and make sure that they're not fudging to give an opinion on a topic that they're not the expert on. They're the expert on this and not that. Um, the foundational requirement for expert testimony is it has to be based on matter that's a type that reasonably may be relied on by an expert in forming an opinion upon which the subject in, to which his testimony relates unless the expert's precluded to have, by law from having such matters a basis for the opinion. What can the expert rely on? Okay? And in theory, it's supposed to be reliable hearsay. Now, you know and I know the kitchen sink is coming in, right? Whatever nonsense shred of hearsay, triple hearsay, seems to come in on these. Um, 801 of the evidence code is the code section on this. Uh, there's, I don't know if you guys are focused on the new Sanchez case, which deals with restructured hearsay a little bit. Uh, it did it in a criminal context, but it's being applied in other contexts. Uh, this is a lecture my, my colleague uh, at work is giving a lecture on this tomorrow, and it's an entire hour just on that one topic. Uh, but it's a whole other topic uh, beyond the scope of what I can cover here. Uh, again, let me restate, the training or knowledge has to relate specifically to the subject matter of the testimony. Now, let's talk about cross. In theory, your cross is supposed to be broad. You're supposed to have wide latitude. I don't know what you guys are experiencing, but we're being cut off all the time on cross. Uh, but in theory, you get to challenge the expert in various ways. Uh, what inadmissible, otherwise inadmissible hearsay evidence comes in through the expert? And there's some cases on this. It's a civil case called Grimshaw that says, and everyone's ignoring this, but says they can't get in the details of inadmissible hearsay on direct. So what we actually do when we put on the witness is we sandbag, put in the opinion, have a general comment, and then sit back and see if the prosecutor will fall right into the trap and say, oh yeah? Well, what's that based on? Bingo, it all comes in. Okay? That's a little subtle, uh, and of course it could blow up in your face. But in theory, the details that the expert's relying on are not supposed to come in on direct. I don't know about you, but it's coming in all the time in the cases I see, so factor that in. Uh, I don't have any comment on that. Um, okay. Hypothetical ex uh, questions. I, are you seeing this a lot? I almost never see this in a criminal case. And I don't know why. You should be able to ask, the case law says you can ask hypothetical questions. There has to be some relation to the case. You can't just say, so, assuming you were in Russia and Putin showed up. Okay? That might be a little hard to tie into your, uh, you know, uh, home welfare case. I'm just saying. But uh, you can ask hypothetical questions to challenge the expert. And I think, uh, I'm a big guy for challenging experts, and, and sometimes when you start to explore a little bit, it turns out that they either don't know what they're talking about or they're full of shit. Uh, and you can sometimes expose that by using hypothetical questions. Um, the limits on hypothetical questions, again, I don't see people doing this much, but I think we're underusing this tool. But let me just run through the requirements. The facts, have to, it, the facts and the hypo have to be within the limits of the evidence. Uh, they have to have some basis in the facts. Um, you can ask them on direct, and you can ask them on cross, and in theory, you have wide latitude on cross. I just think we're not using them at the level we should. Okay, next one's pop quiz narrative. Let me see a poll. How many people in this room have either objected or heard the objection narrative, the witness and testimony narrative? Let me see hands, okay? Guess what, another myth. No such objection. And there's a case, it's just a California Supreme Court case, that says that a witness can testify from an error. There's a case saying it's okay to do this. Now, I ask this question when I do criminal you know, law training. Everyone puts up their hand. Uh, and then I ask, how many of you have had the narrative objection sustained? Let me see hands on that. Okay? Right. All wrong. All wrong. 100% wrong. Right? But every judge thinks it. Right? Which gives you a tool to get it in. Now, I'm not a big advocate of narrative uh, form of question. The case says you can do it. Um, if you're objecting and the judge says, give me some authority, do not give them this case. Rosotto was the name of the case. Uh, I use 765A, which says the judge has the power to control the way the evidence comes out, which you can see doesn't say anything about narrative at all, does it? Okay. But so I had something to say to the judge. Uh, and again, I don't favor this tactically. Uh, if you had a, an opponent who would let you do it, I mean, there are some people who could tell the story better if they didn't have to do the Q&A, but I, don't, I just don't know anybody's letting anybody do it. So even though it's a myth, 
It's one of the remiss we can't do anything about. Okay, assumes fact, not in evidence. Now, there's all kinds of misconduct in criminal cases where prosecutors do this. But I see it occasionally in other contexts. Uh, we go back to the hypotheticals. If you're asking an expert, you should be able to assume facts, not in evidence. A regular witness, sometimes they call people out of order. I'm not sure how much action we get for that because are we going to just recall the witness? Or, I mean, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure how much this gets us in terms of an advancement in our case or our litigation. Uh, but just be aware that there is an objection, assumes the fact, not in evidence. Next is argumentative. So, again, I had a prosecutor in Compton like to argue with the witness. And this cuts both ways. I had, sometimes I had a client who was like streetwise, and he could outfox the DA. He was like, the DA might have book training, but my guy would talk him out of his shoes if it went long enough, right? I let that guy go. I did not object argumentative, okay? Let's just see how this goes. Just, just to, tell you, to tell you a quick side story. So, uh, you guys know what three card Monty is? They put the thing, the thing under the thing and they have three things and then, you know, blah, blah. Okay, so we had a prosecution, a felony prosecution for three card Monty criminal, this stupid thing. And my buddy who's trying the case, the client's like, I'm just that good. I'm not cheating. I'm just that good. And he said, let me see it. The, my friend persuaded the judge to let the client do three card Monty with a juror <laughs> in the jury box. Okay? And so he's doing this and he's doing that, right? He's doing the thing and okay, hey, we're done. And the juror says, it's there. And my guy's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> nope. Not the right one. It was one of the others, not guilty. Okay? I can't imagine how he talked the judge into letting that happen. <clears throat> but this goes to show you. Uh, and that's a guy I would let the, pro the other side argue with that guy until we dropped. Now, on the other hand, you have your weak witnesses who are kind of tentative, and they get challenged, and they start to fold, object, and jump in and try to protect the witness. All right? This is strategic again, which is one of the global themes of the talk. Next, ask and answer. So some of the cases I found when I did Law Desk had really funny names. This is one from 1912, Dudell versus Shue. You can't make up names like that, okay? Uh, and in theory, asked and answered should never apply to cross-examination. Now, you know and I know we get cut off. But in theory, it shouldn't apply. You should be able to ask it repeatedly. More interestingly, I almost never got this objection sustained when the DA put it in for the third. I'm like, Your Honor, we've heard this three times now. Could we move on? Ask and answer. Overrule it, uh, counsel. We can, uh, let's hear it a couple more times. <laughs> he says your client's guilty. Let's uh, the jury hear it a couple more times. <laughs> so I never got a lot of action on this one. Uh, and, but let me say this. So here's another tactic. I would do this to cue the jury, but I think it's also a legitimate thing to cue the judge. It's like, we've heard this before. They're just repeating themselves. Ask and answer. Right? So you're cueing the judge. Yeah, yeah, come on, come on. They're beating a dead horse here, okay? So it works better with juries, but I think there are judges who will get that, you know, the other side's wasting their time. And of course, we all know, when you pop quiz, the goal of every judge in the criminal, civil, penalty, every system, the number one goal of all judges, are, you know, already know the answer? Wait, wait, don't, don't say it then. Number one, number one goal of all judges, say it. Get out of Go home early, correct. <laughs> So if the other side is the one making a mistake because I'm repeating stuff, you get whatever edge you get from that, which may not be much, but there it is. Next is cumulative, which is similar. And let me just say this, uh, you know, watching the Manafort trial, uh, this is the problem with prosecutors, and maybe it's the right strategy in Manafort, but they tend to overtry their case. So I was reading a case once uh, recently, a big case actually, where the DA was presenting cell site location information of the guy's phone being a, at the location of the robbery, right? Which you would think might be good evidence, except the DA put on, the guy had, there were two gangs robbing restaurants in the city. And my guy was in, or the defendant was in one. And they had one of the guy, gang members testify against him. They had video, they had DNA, they had live witnesses. My favorite witness was, they came out of the, uh, out of a Carl's Jr. or something, and one of the uh, witnesses saw that they were coming out and takes out a piece of paper, starts writing their license plate down. So the defendant, of course, he can't let that happen. So he takes out his revolver and starts shooting at the guy. And the guy did exactly what you and I would do. Exactly. Pulled out his own gun, and there was a gun now. <laughs> Nobody got hurt. But, so they call that guy, right? So they have 
ID, video, DNA, another member of the gang testified. And then they put the cell site location information in. Nothing like over trying your case. Okay? And there's a lot of lawyers who just put on, keep putting on the evidence, which I love when I was a defense lawyer with no defense, because <laughs> something would go wrong with one of those and that would be my defense. Because if they just put on what they needed to win, I would have nothing. So the whole object, the whole point of cumulative is, again, you may not want to object if you see, if you think that they'll develop, they'll, you know, the other thing is asking the witness the same question over and over again, what happens when the witness gives a different answer, right? So I'm not necessarily one that would always object, but you can object again to get the judge to go home early and play that card, okay? Uh, cumulative is 352, as is prejudicial. So this is one we use in criminal a lot, but it applies to all, and that is the judge is supposed to, on an objection on 352 of the evidence code, supposed to weigh the probative value versus the prejudicial value and consumption of time and confusion. In criminal, this always means we lose. Just a shorthand, we lose. Uh, I don't know how that plays in dependency, uh, but, uh, and I, you know, a judge is going to say, I'm not prejudiced, don't worry about me. I can, look at these, I can look at these gory pictures all day, not a problem for me, right? I mean, it's funny to say that to a judge, right? So maybe the time consumption might be the better argument, but be aware of the prejudicial uh, 352. Okay, exceeds the scope of direct. So I'm cross examining, I'm you know, challenging the witness. And what I get back is this, uh, this cross-examination exceeds the scope of the direct examination. Okay, it's technically a valid objection because in theory the scope of direct is controls the scope of cross. Now, what that means though is remember the relevancy concept. So if the witness was drinking on the day in question, that's, they didn't testify to that, right? But that doesn't matter because it is relevant. So in that situation, it crosses, does not exceed the scope of direct. Now the flip side of that is, in theory, you should be able to control the testimony and only testify to one thing. So in criminal, what happens is we have two counts of robbery. The guy's guilty on one and is fighting the other. Okay? So he wants to get on the stand and deny count two, but not have to admit count one. In the real world, this never works. In theory, under the case law, it should be. In theory, you can put on a witness to testify to just one thing and limit the scope of cross. In my experience, that does not work. So even though there's cases here that support it, you might be desperate and have to try that in case because that's all you got. But, uh, and I would try to do it at the front end. I would say, I'm calling this witness just to testify to what happened on July 4th at the picnic, not what happened on July 5th, not 6th, not the 3rd, not midnight. And that's all I'm calling a witness on. It is probably not going to work, just in the real world. But if you were desperate, you might try it. And there's some case law here that supports that whole approach. Um, and of course, the rule about scope of cross does not apply to impeachment evidence at all. All of the impeachment evidence is admissible, even though it's literally, obviously, indirect. They didn't put it in, right? OK. So that's a quick review of objections to questions. Now I'm going to talk about objections to answers. There'll be some overlap, but there's some that I thought are distinctively about answers. So the first is non-responsive. So this is the bane of the existence of a cross-examiner. You're asking the questions, and they're just repeating their direct. They're not answering your questions. Okay? Now this is an art form. There are judges, I, I'm sure there are, who will say, answer the damn question. Okay? I never saw one of those, but I believe they exist. I never relied on that, because I never saw one. I tried to control the witness myself. Um, and I want to just share with you a Jerry Spence trick, that, trick, technique, let's say, that he does. So he's got the officer, and he's saying, you know, did you turn left? And the officer says, your client pulled a gun on me. Yeah, yeah. Did you turn left? Well, your client pulled a gun on me. Yeah. But did you turn left? Okay. So here's what he does. He goes, this is very low tech. He goes to the, wall, to, to, the, to the board with butcher paper and writes, did you turn left? And he says to the officer, uh, officer, can you read? <laughs> yes, okay, could you read that sentence? Okay, what's the answer? <laughs> they, would, they would answer the question again. Okay. <laughs> uh, the art form here is to ask a narrow focus questions and to try to force the witness into your mode. Now I'm gonna give you my 90-second cross-examination technique. Uh, I went to a national program 
uh, some years ago, I was one of the trainers, and the guy who taught cross-examination, it's the best cross-examination I've ever seen, he did the cross-examination of Goldilocks on her identification of three bears. <laughs> Big win. Here's the thing. Don't ask questions. Make statements. Okay? So I'm going to do it with Ari because she's an easy victim. <clears throat> okay, don't answer though, Ari. Okay? okay? This is my luck, Ari. Ari was helping me even though she didn't know she was going to help me. Okay, so you were, you were there at 3rd in Maine, right? No, don't answer. You were there at noon, right? You saw what happened, right? You didn't look to your left. You didn't look at the person behind the guy. You didn't see the gun. You see what I'm doing? I'm no longer asking questions. Okay? Set it up with a pattern. A pattern. Right? Right? And then stop saying right. Just keep making statements. Now, somebody may say, hey, wait a minute, I didn't hear a question. If you get into the flow, the person will just talk to you. And what you want is a conversation where basically they're admitting that they, whatever the problem is, you need them to admit. Okay? That's my cross-examination technique. Uh, cost a lot of money for people to go to that training to get that one thing. Uh, but that's the key to cross-examination. You got it free. Well, wait, maybe we shouldn't charge it? I think we should. Uh, so the point is, you need to control the witness. This is an overarching problem in your cases. When you have a witness on the stand, you have an expert, you have a, uh, a father, a mother, or whatever, you need to get control of the witness. And you do that by controlling, by using non-responsive. And I would rarely almost never say, judge, please order an answer, because the judge is going to say, I can answer the question, can't tell me, me, right? So I don't do that. I control them myself. I'm like, well, perhaps you didn't understand that question. Let me say it again louder, <laughs> okay? And, and get them into a rhythm. The, the key to this is rhythm. Once you get them in a rhythm, then stop asking questions. Just start making statements and get them to talk to you until they hopefully admit that they can't really identify the bears Right? Because it's the Goldilocks case. Remember that? Okay. <laughs> Next, foundation for opinion. We've already covered that. It, it could come into play as, a, as part of an answer. Irrelevant, we've covered that. Let's talk about incompetent. So there's a couple of different aspects of incompetent as a witness. Um, one of them is the person was incompetent at the time. They were on drugs. They were drunk. They didn't, they, they didn't you know, they were literally incompetent at the time. And the other is so that they don't know what happened. The other is that they're incompetent now. And we always think about child witnesses being incompetent now. I don't know how you guys are doing, but we never win these competency challenges. The DA has a little script. If I said the, the paper was yellow, would it be a truth or a lie? It would be true. If I said it was green, would it be a truth? A lie. Thank you! Qualified. <laughs> We're like, can we just ask a question or two? No! Shut the fuck up! <laughs> That's not what they're saying to you? Okay, well, I'm glad you're That's what they're saying about So the point is, and I got another great case name. This one's from 1918. Phil Dew versus Shattuck and Nimmo Warehouse. <laughs> you just can't make this stuff up. Okay? And it talks about incompetency, and there's some more recent cases than that, 1918 case, uh, that talk about the two different kinds of incompetence. It's the burden of the party presenting the witness to show competence. If you object, they have to put a foundation in to establish the competency of the witness. Now, again, tactically, you may want to do it in cross, but I've actually done it where I've done a... a challenged the witness's competency uh, and done a full cross-examination of the competency. I had a witness who was taking medication, but it turned out there were several different doctors and she was stacking all the different medications. And I had an expert who would testify about how, how she, she was so loopy she didn't know what happened. I, of course, lost the case. Remember, I'm in a pellet. <laughs> That's incompetency. Okay, chain of custody. I don't, are you seeing chain of custody much? Maybe you're not seeing this much. In criminal, okay, just I have to complain about this. This is one of the things I just hate. The lawyers are always calling me and saying, oh, I got a chain of custody. They can't prove the gun, chain of custody, or the drugs, or whatever. Uh, give me a case. And I say to them, do you not make me give you a case. You will not like me. Just argue we all know. No, no, I just need a case, any case. No, I don't want to give a case. Please, please, please. You're going to call back mad. No, 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 just give me anything. So I give them the case. And of course, the case says, as long as it's reasonably probable, it's the same thing. So then they call me back and say, why would you give me that case? I lost. It's like, I told you not to give the case. Okay. So chain of custody uh, will not get any action. Experimental evidence. I rarely see this, but in theory, you can do experiments in the court. I mean, it seems like an unusual thing, but you could do them. And there's a whole body of law on the foundation for experimental evidence. And I'm just quickly run through it. The experiment has to be relevant. It has to be conducted under substantially similar conditions. 
Uh, it won't consume undue time, confuse the issues, or be misleading the jury. The preliminary facts to support its relevancy is the experiment was conducted under the same or similar circumstances as those existing when the event in question took place. Um, whether the conditions were substantially identical, not absolutely identical. Um, okay, next, best evidence rule. You guys remember the best evidence rule? Remember that rule? Let me see hands. Does everybody remember this rule? You know that it's gone? There's no more best evidence rule, okay? No more, gone. Uh, so they replaced it with the catchily named secondary evidence rule. Ooh, baby, baby, secondary evidence rule. And I would like to give you a lecture on the secondary evidence rule, but I do not want you to all go into a coma. So I am not going to do that because uh, it's not exciting. I've written it out. If this actually comes up where you're litigating a secondary evidence issue, you can read my handout. And if you're having trouble sleeping, it will work for that too. All right. Uh, corpus electi is a criminal one. Let's talk about authentication. So the, uh, this is very poorly understood. People think they have to have the person who took the picture to testify to the foundation uh, to get it into evidence. This is not true. The foundation or authentication of a photograph only requires anybody to say that the photograph accurately depicts the event at the time of question or the scene or whatever it is. Accurately depicts the scene. When I was in trials, I had drunk driving cases. I had my investigator go take pictures of the scene to show the road was rough or whatever stupid point I was making. Uh, and I would ask the officer, the arresting officer, Hey, I have a picture here. Okay, I, this is really retro. I didn't have a phone, and, you know, I had a picture. I'd say, oh, this is the way it looked on the day in question. Is that right? That's right. Your Honor, I offer it in evidence. Well, you don't have the photographer. I don't need it. I put him on. Okay? So this is very poorly understood. Um, it, uh, it does go with a, just a quick story. So let me tell you a quick story. First case I ever handled, 1973, I'm a law student. Certified <laughs> law student. I got to handle a case. I, so I was in the juvenile section, juvenile delinquency section, of the San Francisco Public Defender's Office. And they let me pick a case. Well, I wasn't going to pick a kid who was innocent. So I picked the guiltiest kid I could find. Here's how guilty he was. He burglarizes the house. He comes out. The guy across the street is a professional photographer with a studio in his house who looks out the window and sees an obviously burglar coming out of the house and takes photographs. It made the front page of the paper. They, they pixelated out the kid's face, okay? Uh, you'll be stunned to hear, I did not win this. <laughs> but uh, the foundation, I was like loaded for bear, okay? Who's going to, do they have the photographer? Because that's one where I don't know how they could get the foundation in without the actual photographer, right? How can they get somebody to say, that picture accurately shows the person who's coming out for rising the house, right? So that one they would need it for. I was so ready for bear on that, for all the good it did. Okay, so, uh, and for foundation and authentication purposes, a uh, similar item can be offered. So, you know, in criminal, they're offering baseball bats, and I'm just like, well, that's not the baseball bat that the person used. Well, it's a Dodger bat, it's close enough for government work. I'm like, no, no, yes, yes, the case law is bad on this. So, it, you might, this is something you might use, is that if you don't have the actual object, but you have something similar, you can present it and, and use it as part of your demo. The judge. You would think a judge might be a little more flexible than uh, admitted for the jury. Okay, hearsay. Uh, I, I, a lecture on hearsay would cover longer than I have in this slide. Uh, and there are a lot of very specific hearsay rules applicable to criminal only. So I'm not going to cover those if you're really just desperate for, you know, reading, riveting reading in case you're having trouble sleeping at night. You can read through my brilliant analysis of hearsay. I do want to cover a couple of hearsay rules that apply to everything. Prior and consistent statements. Prior and consistent statements are really the key, in my opinion, cross-examination. Rarely do we say, so, you're saying you saw this at Third and Main, here's a picture of you at Fifth and, 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 and Smith Streets. Ha! I destroy you, right? That's not what we're doing. We cross-examine with, well, you told the officer that he hit you with a bat, but now you're testifying that he hit you with a stick. They, Your Honor, clearly, you know, we won't, right? Mm -hmm. So, your in prior consistent statements are not hearsay. They're an exception to the hearsay rule. And in my opinion, now let me just give you a 30-second lecture on this. The best I ever did in cross-examination was not 
getting the witness to admit the inconsistency. It was having the witness deny the inconsistency. Didn't you tell Officer Schmuck that he hit you on the nose? No, I never told Officer Schmuck that. Your Honor, we'd like to call Officer Schmuck. That's what the witness told me. And then you would say to the jury, or the judge in this case, why would Officer Schmuck lie? He's not a schmuck. <laughs> right? So my point being, what you want is the witness to lie and catch them in the lie in court. That's what you want. Your, your nuance of stick versus bat is pretty trivial. You're not going to win the case probably based on that distinction. Having the witness deny it and calling somebody who can't be really challenged, a police officer or a body cam video maybe or something, is how you're going to get action across. Okay, That's my little 30 second using prior consistent statements. Uh, there's a whole body of law on the witness saying, I don't know. And again, I'd like to discuss it with you in detail, but I want to keep you awake. Uh, so the I don't know, which if you think about it, is not inconsistent with whatever the witness said, right? Hit me with the baseball bat. Would you say he hit me with the stick? I don't know. I don't remember. Well, that's not inconsistent, right? Do you see that? Okay. But it can be found inconsistent. The judge can find that it's inconsistent. It's really a lie and therefore allow in the inconsistent statement. Um, that's the, the law on this. Okay, declaration that gets interest. Uh, there's this new Grimes case in criminal that changed the rules somewhat, uh, but that's irrelevant because it's only applicable to criminal. In civil, the general declaration against interest rules apply. And you know, the interest, declaration against interest is not limited to criminal. There's a, you know, a whole list of different things that can qualify as declarations against interest. Uh, obloquy, I love that word, um, and stuff like that. So when you're trying to offer a piece of hearsay, or, or someone's offering it against you, I figure out whether it's a, a declaration that gets interest and really applies or not, and you may have a ground to resist it, or you may have a ground to get it in yourself if that's what you're on. Okay, state of mind. My experience, most of the time, when hearsay is offered, I have a quick hearsay story to tell you. It's a criminal, I'm sorry, delinquency case where the prosecutor offered a piece of hearsay, and our lawyer objected. I'm sure this is a true story. Our lawyer objected hearsay, and the judge said, it looks like hearsay to me, counsel. What's your theory? How are you getting around a hearsay objection? And the prosecutor said, I cannot prove my case without this piece of evidence. <laughs> okay, I'm sure it's a true story. Uh, so um, when you are faced, when you make a hearsay objection and you win, I know that could happen. I mean, it must have happened once. <laughs> They're going to say it's offered for state of mind. That the immediate fallback is it's not offered for the truth, it's offered for state of mind. Okay, well, it's not offered for the truth, what is it? Yeah, but then how is it relevant? Now, the state of mind thing, there are scenarios where state of mind might actually be at issue, but it's very unusual. And so when they shift off of the, you know, I'm offering it, uh, not offered for its truth, then you have to say, well, how is state of mind relevant? And that's the issue you're going to litigate in terms of challenging that as well. Okay, res gestae. Has anybody heard of this? Am I just too old for the room? Okay, back in my day, and there's a very funny case here, Arduno, that talks about this. Uh, res gestae is a verbal act. So when I say, so if you give me your drink, what's the drink? Water. Water. Wow! If you give me water, I'll give you a dollar. Okay? Now, is that hearsay? It's not hearsay because it's a verbal act. The operative wor words are operative words that mean something. Let me give you a better example in criminal. Give me the water or I'll blow your brains out, okay? Not offered for truth. I probably don't want to blow her brains out, okay? But it doesn't matter because it's an operative fact. And the term was res gesti was the old Latin term. Uh, but uh, a verbal act. And verbal acts aren't excluded. Now, they might not be relevant, but they're not hearsay. Not everything said, I mean, the level of knowledge of hearsay is so low. The, 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 the fact that something is said out of court doesn't make it hearsay, right? So um, that's that, okay, double hearsay. Okay, I get this question a lot for some reason. So A said to B who said to C and C is testifying, right? So is that admissible? And the answer is you look at each level of hearsay and see if there's an exception. And if there's an exception to every level, you get it in. Or they get it in against you. And if there's one level where they can't get it in, then it doesn't come in. All right? So the whole, there's like a myth that if it's double hearsay, it doesn't come in. That's not right. You have to look at each level of hearsay and try to figure out whether there's something that admits it or doesn't admit it. Okay? Impeaching hearsay declarants. 
So hearsay comes in. They don't have the witness. They put somebody else on who says the witness told me X. Right? It's pure hearsay. But it comes in. What do you what can you do to impeach it? Okay, now before I go through the law, I want you to think for a second. If they don't have the witness, they can't be better off than if they had the witness, right? So there's a code section, 1202, and there's a case, criminal case, that says you get to impeach a hearsay declarant just as though they were testifying. A hearsay declarant is the person who made the statement out of court. Okay? So if you have, let me take a simple example. If you have a mother and she's not there, she's not testifying, she's not even not testifying, she's not in the room. And they call a police officer to say, the mother told me the father hit the kid. Okay? Right? So she's not there. But you get to cross-examine the cop or put on any evidence. So let's assume you have a witness who heard her say she did it, the father didn't do it. Okay? Now, if she were there, you could ask her about it. Hopefully she deny it. That's what I want, right? I want the denial so that I can impeach her. And then you get to put the, the, your witness on, right? Well, the fact that they don't have her doesn't mean you don't get to do it. You do get to do it. When they put on the officer, you do your cross, whatever. You then can present your witness who will testify that she said she did it, not the father. You get to impeach the hearsay declarant exactly as though the worst person is actually in the courtroom testifying, okay? And I, people don't seem to understand this, and it comes up all the time. I'm getting called tons of questions on it. Okay. The last part of the talk is foundations. Uh, and I, I, again, I don't want you to go comatose. The foundation for business records and official records um, is technical. Some of you probably already know this stuff. Uh, I try to write a handout where I laid out the, you know, you have to establish elements A, B, C, D. Sometimes your stuff comes with a cover note that self-authenticates. Uh, and I don't, I, again, I'd love to do a lecture on foundation, but I don't, you know, it's, now we're really running into time bombs. I don't want to, I don't want you to be comatose. So I don't want you to stop thinking about that. Okay. Uh, last topic. Well, there'll be an ending after the last topic. Scope of redirect examination. So, in theory, you ask questions, the other side cross-examines. In theory, you get to do a redirect, then a recross, then a re-redirect, then a re-recross. In theory, limited to the scope. But again, you can always recall the witness or ask for them to reopen. So uh, the limitation on this is not so substantial. All right, so I'm at the very end, and here's what I want you to take away from this talk, okay? First, you've got to have more up your sleeve in your quiver than three objections. You've got to have lots of different possible objections, both to be as effective as you can and to implement the other strategy. And the other strategy is, what the fuck are you doing in the case? <laughs> Don't just react. What's your strategy in the case? What are you trying to accomplish? And what is your evidentiary strategy? I tell the criminal lawyers, write down on a piece of paper your defense, self-defense. Write it down. And then write down an evidentiary strategy. No objections. Object to everything. Throw the prosecutor off. I mean, whatever. Okay? Sometimes it's like, we're putting everything in. They're objecting. Make it look like the other side's trying to cover up. Sometimes, Right? I mean, if, if there's a variety of strategies. I tell the lawyers, write down a strategy and then implement that strategy and then be flexible and adapt to it. Okay? Don't just react. Now that you know a whole bunch more objections, I don't want to hear that in the next trial you made three times as many objections, unless that's a valid strategy, unless that's what you were trying to make happen because you're trying to implement a strategy. My point, and I do have a point, is have a strategy. <laughs> think about your cases. Think about what you're doing in your trials, in your adjudications. Think about what you're trying to accomplish. Are you trying to throw the prosecutor off? Are you trying to open the door? Are you trying to close the door? Are you trying to, whatever it is. Have a strategy. So you have lots of different things you can put on the table, but don't show off and just put them on the table because they're on the table. Okay? Leave them on the table if tactically that's best for you. Make judgments about what you're trying to accomplish in the case and use that to drive what you actually litigate. All right, I'm done, and I hit my time perfectly, unless I'm wrong. Thank you. Hey,
okay, where are you going? You're I'm going over here because I'm going to wait. She said I had to stop at 115. That's what she said. I did whatever she said. Uh, I